is Totally 80s, the podcast dedicated to the music of the greatest decade ever. So, turn up your Walkman, loosen that scrunchie, and get ready to talk 80s with your host, Lindsay Parker. Hi, I'm Lindsay Parker from Yahoo Entertainment and Sirius XM Volume, and this is another episode of Totally 80s. If this is the first time you're joining us, why not take a second to follow us at Totally 80s on Facebook and Instagram, or email us your comments and show ideas to podcast at totally80s.com. You can also check us out on video as well as on our Totally 80s YouTube channel, so check us out there if you are so inclined. And joining me Today is my partner in all things 80s, the midger to my Bob Geldof, Don Hughes. <laughs> well, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna switch those. Midge was really in charge when he came to it. He absolutely was. And I'm pretty sure Midger's uh one of his great contributions to pop culture is definitely gonna come up early at our conversation today. Did you notice, John? I did not actually introduce you as the other John Hughes. I think you have taken the number one John Hughes position in my mind after doing the Totally 80s podcast for yeah. about a year now. I love the original John Hughes, but I think when you've been, you know, departed from this planet after 30 or so years, it may be time to let someone else step in. Well, that you are the man for the job. And yeah, we've been doing this for almost a year now. And it right. is, believe it or not, that time of year again. It's been a crazy year, 2020. It's kind of hard to sort of get into the holiday spirit, the Christmas spirit. But we want to make the most of it and spread some early holiday cheer. So our topic today is is holiday songs of the 1980s. I am very ready for it. I see you are wearing a, a on-brand Christmas, on-topic Christmas sweater. Is that the Monkees sweater? Yeah. The Monkees from their uh, Christmas record from two years ago. Uh, a classic, an instant classic. Yeah, it worked on that with Adam Schlesinger and uh, the band. And uh, listen to it now on all streaming platforms. <laughs> it had, I mean, it had uh, XTC's Andy Partridge on it, who obviously they did a very awesome eighties Christmas song. We'll talk about, I have, I wore this shirt for you though. I hope if people are watching this on video, I should just wear this year round. I should not wait till December to wear this. This is my young ones. The people's poet, Rick Mayall, hands up who likes me Christmas sweater. The fashion statement I'm making with this sweater is I am susceptible to Facebook ads. The algorithm worked. I was just scrolling, doom scrolling through Facebook. And suddenly I saw a young runs Christmas uh, sweatshirt with a picture of Rick doing the hands of who likes me. And I was like, hands up. I'm buying that. So how can you scroll past that and not hit buy now? There was a part of me that didn't want to click on it because I'm giving you know, the Borg, what it wants. It's like it somehow fed into my brain, knows I like the young ones, perhaps because we've talked about it on Totally 80s before. It like somehow picked up on me talking about it, but I had to buy it. So I had to wear it today because it's completely appropriate for an 80s Christmas special. For so sure. we talked we talked about Geldof and Midger. So like, I know it's a Captain Obvious move, but I mean, we kind of have to start with not just the best Christmas song of the 80s, but I would go so far as to say the best Christmas song of all time. Well, Do they Ma know it's Christmas by Band Aid? Mariah might want a word with you, but she's not '80s, so we can. She's not we '80s. We can definitely she's say it's the best of the '80s, no doubt. You know who doesn't think that? Who? Midge, you're himself. Yeah, he's not a fan. He he's thinks, not. Yeah, he thinks he just kind of pooped it out one day. <laughs> Well, they did it really, really um, impromptu. From I've interviewed Midge a couple of times about this for anniversaries of the song, and he wrote it in a couple of days. I to your point that you made earlier that you know Midge was the MVP of this. A lot of people do not know that he was not only the guy who wrote co-wrote the song with Bob Geldof. I think probably people listening to this podcast know that, but a lot of people in general don't know that he played every single instrument on it except for some Phil Collins drums. You know, when you're seeing John Taylor, you know, playing bass in that video, he didn't actually play bass on the track. They didn't actually get like 50 80s people in a room to record the song. It was all Midge and he deserves it. He, he's very humble. He does not like the song. I have a couple quotes. He calls it, this is from an interview I did last year, an okay song that became something much better than it actually was. And then he goes on to say, if you listen to the song, it's a song with no real pop sensibilities. There's no real structure to it. Most songs have an intro and a verse and a chorus, but this is just the thing that started and kind of grew. And he does have a point that the chorus, if there is one, I guess is the feed the world refrain, which does not come in until like oh. four minutes in the song. In fact, a, a friend of mine, a millennial friend of mine, he thought there were two different songs. He thought Band-Aid did a song called Do They Know It's Christmas and a song called Feed the World because oh. he thought they he's heard... 
separate chunks of it. And he did not realize they were the same song. Oh, we got to teach the children, Lindsay. Teach the I have, children. I have schooled him. I have schooled him. <laughs> to that being said, though, Midger, mid with all due respect, Mr. Yer, Sir Yer, to, uh, you know, he's a sir in my book. He's wrong. He's absolutely well, wrong. It's a great who, song. Who's responsible for the lyrics? The lyrics, John, have not aged that well. <laughs> no. uh, they, meant, they meant well. Yes. It, it does kind of smack of white savior syndrome, you know, poor about like, oh, the poor. poor. Well, you know, that actually is the line. It's interesting because in the same interview I did with Midge, he talks about how actually this was kind of a breakout moment for you two in 1984 when Band-Aid got together you two were not the you two they are now and they were kind of more of a college rock band on the rise yeah. and that moment with bono singing so stridently oh tonight like that was kind of the moment he says in the studio when they were recording the song where everybody kind of went wow and took notice of bono as a force that line tonight that god it's them instead of you i took it this is how i took it this is why i didn't find offense by it I thought it was making a comment on us privileged people who mm. are at home safe and warm and dry with our cocoa and our eggnog and our families. And we're like, Oh, therefore, thank God that I won the, you know, the lot, the genetic lottery and wasn't born in a place that's um, riddled with famine and tragedy and stuff. Like, basically I thought it was trying to make some kind of comment on how, we do tend to look away. I don't know. I think that's what they were trying to do. I don't think they actually meant it literally like, thank God I'm not in Africa. That would suck. I don't think they meant it that way. At the time growing up uh, back then and listening to it over and over again, it never really hit me. It never struck me as being a particularly offensive line or a strange line, but you know, with history and, and the way things have evolved since then, I hear it now and I do kind of cringe because it's just, you know, first of all, it's Bono, the birth of Ernest Bono. I mean, <laughs> was he wearing sunglasses? I don't recall. Not yet, but he's not all, yet. you know, you know, uh, world on his shoulders, striding into the studio, standing next to Tony Hadley. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> no. it's this nice contrast of uh, rock stars at the time. But yeah, it was the birth of Ernest Bono. And I think Unforgettable Fire had just come out. They just scraped the top 40 in the US with pride in the name of love. So they were they were just breaking mainstream-ish. But this is what kicked the door open for you too, for sure. Absolutely. And then of course he had the breakout moment, which we've talked about in our Feeling Charitable episode of Totally 80s with Jake Fogelness when he went out into the crowd at Live Aid. So yes, this was the beginning of something. It is ironic that like the line that I guess most people now, uh, God, 36 years later would say is the most problematic line in the song or the song or the most dated, mm -hmm. you know, line is the one that was done by the one who became like the biggest social political activist, you yeah. know, red and all that. By Bono. <laughs> but they, they meant well, they meant well. It's just like, yeah, there's a bit of that white savior syndrome and definitely some lack of education about the the weather in Africa or the geography in Africa. But I do I do still get chills every time, no pun intended, I get chills when I hear the song. Like I don't feel like it's Christmas time until I hear that song in a mall or a supermarket or on a on a ch radio station. Like it just it was such a Christmas miracle to me when they got all those people together in a room. It's a dumb thing to say, knowing who is responsible for it, but I'm going to say it anyway. I loved it back then because I thought it sounded just like an Ultravox song. It sounds like it's right off of Lament. Uh, you've got, you know, that patented Ultravox uh, synth sound and everything in there. And Ultravox could never buy a hit here in the US, but here they have one of the biggest Christmas songs of all time from their front man. And it was just, it was, it was awesome, but a source of frustration for a little new wave uh, music snob John. <laughs> did did you know where the sample that kind of gives it that shining effect comes from? You would know oh, this. Well, it come it comes from Tears for Fears, a song on the hurting. It is escape me which one, but you would yeah. probably know if you listen. I think it's memory fades, actually. Yeah. It's the and beginning. Right. They sampled that without Tears for Fears permission. Tears for Fears found it out later and were fine with it. You know, obviously it was a charity song. But <laughs> <laughs> so technically tears for fears are on the song, even though they weren't in the studio. So that sort of added that wintry effect. Cause of course the hurting is a very like wintry sounding album, but have you, since we're talking about people from the eighties that weren't technically on the song, but maybe kind of got 
you know, slid into it in some kind of way. Have you ever seen the episode of Top of the Pops? It is on YouTube where they performed this on Top of the Pops when the song was number one in England. I think it was the Christmas number one, which in England is like a very big deal or used to be. Have yeah. you ever seen it? It's the funniest I, thing ever. Because who, who lip syncs Bono's line? Because Bono's Paul, not. Paul, Paul Weller. <laughs> and he lip syncs it really badly. He would not win a lip sync on RuPaul's Drag Race. He was not lip syncing for his life. But yeah, he almost, it's very weird. Like there's people in it, like Frankie Goes to Hollywood, who actually were on the flip side of the Feed yeah. the World going, I'm Holly Johnson, ho, 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 Feed the World. The but like picked up some people that should have been there. Frankie, of course, David Bowie, who was not there, but he's on the flip side. So they, they kind of like jumped in at the last second and did that, you know, happy Christmas. But the top of the pops thing, it's like Thompson twins are there. Paul Weller's doing the Bono line. I think Sting is lip syncing to part that isn't his. Simon Le Bon looks very confused. You know, <laughs> it's it's so great. It's like they're none. They're all. I mean, they look like they're having a good time. They're just like you know bopping around. But like no one's really actually trying to recreate the top of the. It's the that actually is my favorite alternate cut of Band Aid. But we need to talk about the fact that Band Aid. And do they know it's Christmas? It had a legacy in the 80s that went beyond 1984. I do want to do an honorable mention, even though it's not an 80s song. The greatest Christmas miracle was in 2004 with the Britpop version that had like members of Radiohead and Turn Breaks and Supergrass and Travis <laughs> and The Darkness. And then they had a Dizzy Rascal rap in the middle of it. And like the opening line by Paul Young was instead by the, done by Chris Martin. It's so great. I love Band Aid 3. But we, Scraping into the 80s around 1989 was Band-Aid 2. Let's talk about Band-Aid 2, the Saw, the Stock, Ake and Waterman uh, Band-Aid. Uh, you know, <laughs> they were the sound of a bright young England. In oh, Europe. yeah. <laughs> it was a big deal at the time. It had Kylie, Kylie Minogue on it. It had Jimmy Somerville. It had Ross, Lisa yeah. Stansfield. Wet, I wet, wet. I don't know who was on it, but I'm just going to try to guess. And you tell me how close I, I Well, I told you some of them, but keep guessing. Jason Donovan. I don't have him listed, but I don't have like the Wikipedia page. I'm going to say yes. Banana I will tell you. Man. Yes, they were on, but they okay. have, they actually have the honor of being on both of them because they were on band aid one. And I think that made history in some way. You seem very unimpressed by this fact. You're like, yeah. <laughs> man um, man. Oh, just... Technotronic were on it. Cliff Richard was on it. Lisa Stansfield, Kathy Dennis, Jimmy Somerville from Bronski, but who I was Jimmy Somerville on the first one? No, he was not. He that was a, that was an oversight. He should have been. Well, yeah, there were a lot of oversights on the first one. Where's Adam Ant? He was well, you know, he was oh yeah, in 84, he was still huge. You know, he yeah. got kind of screwed over at Live Aid, though. You know that whole story. Right. When you Where basically they put him on first and had him and let him do one song, and then he made the um questionable decision. To do Viva La Rock. Or no, was that the song he did? But anyway, listen to the oh, Feeling yeah. Charitable podcast for a deep yeah. dive into how that went. But yeah, you're right. There were some oversights. But overall, I really, at the time, I really did not like Band Aid 2 because I was not really on board with the whole Stock Ake and Waterman thing. But now that I have gotten I have an appreciation for their production, which basically every song by St Saw sounded the same, I think they just press play on the drum machine and let it go. But it is an interesting blip in time. I don't think a lot of people in this country know about Band-Aid 2. And, it, but I would say listen to Band-Aid 3 if you want an alternate Band-Aid. Band-Aid 2 aged worse than Band-Aid 1. Oh. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, let's. I just looked it up, John. Yeah. Jason Donovan was on. Good job. So was Kevin Godley. For some reason, from Godly, but no but cream. not Cream. But not Cream. Cream was unavailable. He's breaking his own way in this world now. Um, Sonia was on. Uh, she was big. Okay. Hey, not here. Do you know who Glenn Goldsmith was? Nope. He was on there. Chris. On Chris there. Ray. Chris Ray. Oh, we'll talk about Chris Ria uh, later Rhea. on. Sorry. Yeah. Chris Ria. Yeah. Well, let's let's hit Chris Ria now because it's fairly quick. Have you ever heard a song called "Driving Home for Christmas"? I have not. Educate me. School me. What if I told you that was one of the biggest Christmas songs in the world? X U S. In well, Europe? I would believe you because you're. A constant fountain of knowledge but if anybody else told me that i would say that can't be true i know i've, I've listened to it it's okay it's very uh, <laughs> a very aor-ish ballady you know i'm driving home for christmas that's how it means. <laughs> and i had never heard this song until uh, a few years ago and then i did a little deep dive you know my day job 
and it's one of our biggest streaming Christmas tracks ever. And I was like, wow, that's that's interesting that something could be so huge in Europe and everywhere else and just completely miss us. It's the story of this podcast a lot of times. Totally 80s podcast teaching yeah. the children since January of 2020. I learned something today. Chris Rhea driving home for Christmas. Check it out. Well, let's talk about some other maybe better well-known 80s Christmas songs because I did start this podcast with the bold statement that Do They Know It's Christmas by Band-Aid is the best Christmas song of all time. There are some people, or at least of the 80s, right. there are some people who would say that no, it is by someone who sang on that album, or sorry, sang on that song, George Michael and Wham, that it's Wham's Last Christmas. How I This, of course, now it takes on bittersweet meaning because not only is George Michael no longer with us, but he actually died on Christmas Day of 2016. Yeah. So when you hear like, last Christmas I gave you my heart, but the very next day you gave it away and he died on Christmas, it's like that song hits different now for sure. Yeah. It, it, obviously, the better, more well-constructed song of the two, if you're going <laughs> to... It does have a chorus for sure. Yeah. It's got a it's got it's got a pre-chorus. It's got a bridge. <laughs> it's got everything you need. Um, I, I love that song. It was again another song that took a lot of time to become a Christmas song. Here, it, it, let's go back. It wasn't a single in the U.S. It really? Was, no, it didn't. I, I'm. We can double check this, but it did not come out in the U.S. until the Edge of Heaven. It was included on the Edge of Heaven, the last Wham record. So, you know, MTV would play the video, but it was never a single and it was not, you know, a big thing. It kind of grew over the years, like oh. another thing we're going to talk about later, which was completely ignored back then, but has become a standard Christmas rap. Okay, yeah, that will be a good one. But, you know, what's interesting is I'm, I'm curious for your take on this. A few years ago, a friend of mine started an argument on Facebook that got a lot of comments where he was like, last Christmas is not a Christmas song. What? It's not a, he was <laughs> like, this is. The fact that it takes place at Christmas is incidental, is what he was saying. He's like, this song could very easily have just been last summer, I gave yeah. you my heart, or last winter, or last fall. He went on and on about it, kind of similar to how people argue back and forth about whether Die Hard is a Christmas movie. He was like, Die Hard's a Christmas movie, but last Christmas is not a Christmas song. He went on and on about it, and unfortunately, he did this in December of 2016. And then oh. George Michael died and he was like, did I jinx things? And I'm like, it's Good a Christmas time. song. Now shut up. Yeah, it was bad timing. To his argument, though, I do believe it's a Christmas song just because it has a lot of chimey, you know, sleigh bell effects in it. But it is probably the fact that so many people love it is because it's not just like, isn't it great to drink cider? And see, this is why I don't like, this is why I don't write Christmas songs. That was terrible. As someone, someone who has had a hand in creating a Christmas record. Not in, easy. There is something to be said about taking songs and adding sleigh bells to them. <laughs> adding yeah, see, yeah. George, George Michael could have written Last Summer, I Gave You My Heart. could have been a song about, like, summer love gone bad. Taken out the Christmas bells and put in some, you know, like, tropical, tr Club Tropicana style ephemera to it and made it work. It's a song that works in general, no matter it, whether it's Christmas or not. So I got my friend's point. I, I do too. You know, like I said, there were songs that were submitted for this that were not Christmas songs, and you you change one word to Santa, and all of a sudden you add some sleigh bells and some tinkly little synths, synths and you're in. It's a but Christmas. It is, song. it is hard to write a classic though, because you see my attempt to write one just now, which was called "Isn't It Great to Drink Cider." You're working, on it. you're chopping. Isn't it, so. it great to drink cider? No, I like it. So far. I mean, I do like drinking cider. I don't know if that's a song. You just need a, you just need a hook now. Well, as you said, it took a while for this song to, you know, become a classic. Now it totally is. Little kids know it. I was with my friend and her daughter who was 10 and her and her daughter and kid were like singing and they really were getting into the part that goes, you taught me. They were like singing at the top of their lungs. A lot of people have covered it like Jimmy Eat World covered it for the OC. And it is actually this segues into the next song I want to talk about. I read that last Christmas was the most played Christmas song in the UK. For many years, it was the most played of the 21st century until it was overtaken by another song five years ago in 2015. And now there's another song that holds the record for the most played Christmas song in the UK. And it's probably another song that falls into the category you just said that was not totally an instant, you know, hit for them. Right. You'll 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 know more than me about that. Do you want to do you want to guess? Riddle, do you want to play this yeah. game? 
Maybe it's Fairy Tale of New York. Ding, ding, ding. You have won. My Hello. respect. And Kirsty McCall. Let's not you, forget the gorgeous, talented Kirsty McCall. Absolutely. This song has absolutely taken on a life of its own. I've read that actually it started, I, this is an urban legend, but I think Shane McGowan backed this up in an interview. I mean, that it started as a wager or a challenge because Elvis Costello, who was their producer at the time, challenged them. He said, I bet you can't write a Christmas hit single. And just as we were just talking about now, it's not as easy to do as it may sound. They obviously did it. And this is a rare case, and I would actually say the waitresses who you sort of were hinting at, of an example of someone wrote a Christmas song, and it's probably their most successful, or at least their most beloved, most recognizable, most iconic song. You and I love the Pogues. Lots of people love the Pogues. But I th I think it's fair to say the fairy tale of New York is like their signature hit, right, at this point? Sure, yeah. Which is unusual. You don't. You wouldn't say that, for instance, about Wham. Last Christmas is huge, but when you think Wham, you think Careless Memories or whatever. So, or I think you know, Young Guns go for it. But I digress. For you, Durani, you. Not did I say care? Did I say Careless Whisper? That was a Freudian slip. That wasn't we like a, <laughs> you. You mentioned John earlier, so you've got John Taylor on the brain. Did I say Careless Memories? Yes. That was careless of me. You can leave that in. Don't edit it out because I it it set me up to do a terrible pun, which is very oh, on brand for me. Careless Whisper is what people think of for Wham is what I was trying to say. They don't think Last Christmas, but when they think Pogues, they think Fairy Tale New York. When they think Waitresses, well, I think Square Pegs, but you know, most people think Christmas wrapping. But to stick for with sure. the Pogues for a minute, again, we've talked about lyrics not aging well, whatever, and there's some lyrics that have not aged well, the use of the the F word basically by Kirsty Bacall. But you know, Shane has defended this song saying this is in character of someone yeah. who's not like a particularly um, nice person or, you know, kind of a hard person. And this is how the Kirsty character would be. And also supposedly that word means something different in like Irish slang or something. It means like you lazy saw it. It doesn't necessarily mean uh, it doesn't necessarily have the homophobic connotations. At least then it did not. Well, first of all, um, I think it's a, uh, an amazing song. Uh, I love Kirsty McCall. I have met Kirsty McCall. I oh. have seen Kirsty McCall perform. I have felt Kirsty McCall's energy and she would not ever uh, mean anything like that. She was the sweetest person. Uh, funny, I saw her in Cleveland, Ohio at the Agora Ballroom with my friend Forrest in a snowstorm in December, appropriately enough, in the middle of the winter, with 24 other people. We counted. And she played the entire show like, you know, she didn't care. And right. Right. Um, so I don't really have a problem with that. And the song is, again, it's it's epic. It's almost like a musical. Uh, there's, you know, a storytelling in it, mm -hmm. there's a low beginning, you know, where it's melancholy and sad. And all of a sudden it's almost like an Irish jig. And then you go back to the melancholy thing where they're kind of stuck with each other. I think, you know, despite the lyrics of it being, yeah, you know, I guess I'm stuck with you. What am I going to do? It's kind of sweet. Maybe. There's a there's a tenderness, as you say, it's a storytelling song. And as an aside, I just want to say, Last Christmas was made, sort of made, inspired at least the title of a terrible rom-com a year or two ago. <laughs> Why has this not been made into a movie? Like, come on, people at Hallmark or Lifetime, make the fairy tale of New York movie, but don't fuck it up, basically. Pardon great. my French. It's a great title if they haven't done it already. I mean, Absolutely. You know, what's interesting, though, is I've heard there is a new version of Fairy Tale New York coming out that actually has Kirstie's vocals because perhaps she sort of foresaw that maybe the 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 words, even though it was in character and it was in context of, of the story of the song, might be problematic down the road. So there is a new version being released that does have the the f word so to speak take it out of it and so i think it's maybe going to take on a, a life of its own yet again which i'm very excited about but as i was saying about the whole like storytelling thing and how i would love to see this become a movie in some way and you were talking about how despite all the harsh language and despite all the kind of like oh, i'm stuck with you mentality there is a sweetness to it for sure it does take a turn in the very end so like it starts with them you know being in love and naive and optimistic about the future and then being stuck with each other and hating each other and, you know, throwing slurs and back at each other. And then she's like, you took my, you know, I'm paraphrasing it, but she's like, you took my dreams away. And then, but when he goes, I kept them with me, babe, and put them <laughs> with my own. And, you know, I built my dreams around you. It's like, oh, he actually really cares. Right. And, you know, 
it's kind of like almost like a honeymooners kind of thing or whatever, where they spend like the entire episode, like acting like they hate each other. And then at the end of like every episode of the honeymooners, Ralph Cran will be like, Oh, you're the greatest. And they kiss. And it's like, Oh, actually they don't hate or like Edith, Eddie, Archie, Bu Archie and Edith bunker, you know, it's like that sort of thing. For sure. Um, so I think that's definitely, um, you know, a classic that I think, as I mentioned, is going to take on more life now that there's this new version out. But you were talking about the waitresses. Now, the waitresses, again, as I was saying, their most popular song for the average person. And of course, people know Square Pegs, so or they might know I Know What Boys Like. But, you know, this took on a life of its own. And it's been covered by so many people. It's been covered by the Spice Girls. It's been covered by Kylie Minogue. It's been covered by the Glee cast. What I didn't know until really recently was that it was written for a compilation record, a compilation holiday record called Christmas Record that Z Record. Is it Z or Z E? Z. And Z Record. Christopher Butler talks about the story where he was asked to do this, uh, and they just kind of, again, bashed it out. That well, the thing that's interesting is I've recently listened. The entire album is actually on Spotify. It's called a Christmas record. It came out in 1981 on Z Records. And it has well, first of all, let's just say there's nothing that says Christmas more than a song by Suicide or by Alan Vega. Have you ever <laughs> and Christina's on it too? There's a yeah. Christmas song for Christina. So Was Not Was is on it, Suicide is on it, Alan Vega solo is also on it. Material with Nona Hendrix is on it. I will say the song that Material, Bill Laswell's Material and um, Nona Hendrix do, it's called It's a Holiday, is funky as F. It is great. And I, it doesn't have any other lyrics except It's a Holiday. I think they just like say it over and over, but she's like, she's like, it's a holiday. It's like, dum, dum, dum. it's really good. <laughs> the songs that Suicide and Alan Vega do, particularly the, the Alan Vega song, which actually opens the album. Did you ever see the episode of South Park where like, it, it wasn't real, but like the context was that the holiday special was being done by uh, the holiday uh, pageant that the South Park school was doing was being conducted by Philip Glass. <laughs> no, but I've heard of it. <laughs> there was an episode of South Park that was sort of making fun of the fact that the holidays have become so PC and okay. that's like you sh can't say Christmas or you can't whatever. You have to be inclusive. And it was making fun of people being overly PC that it, like they couldn't have. S yeah, like, they started taking everything Christmassy out of the pageant. Like n there couldn't be Santa. There couldn't be Rudolph. There couldn't be a tree. There couldn't be a menorah. There couldn't be anything that like could possibly alienate someone of a different religion. So it just came. To <laughs> it just ended up with all of the kids on stage with Philip Glass going, the snow is so bright. It burns my eyes. And I'm like, this actually should be a real song, but it like very avant-garde. And that's what the Suicide and Alan Vega songs sound like on this album. And every song on the album is pretty uncommercial is what I, is the point I'm trying to make. But then smack dab in the middle of this track listing of this very uncommercial, aggressively new wave, artsy compilation is this super pop song that became a Christmas classic. It completely stands out from the rest of the album. And it's interesting to me, I, I guess what you're trying to tell me is the waitresses in no way thought they were writing a classic. They certainly didn't set out to write one. It, Christopher Butler, the guitarist and the, the leader of the waitresses, uh, tells a story about how they were asked the last minute, hey, are the labels doing a Christmas compilation? Do you, you Can you throw something together pretty quick? And they just bash it out. I don't know how long it took them, but it, if you listen, it's another one of those weird songs where there's not really a chorus. There's kind of an instrumental break that repeats, you know, that din -din 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 -din, but that's almost the chorus that, yeah, yeah. There's, the, there's Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, but yeah. I think, but that comes at the end, much like feed the world, right? Exactly. Exactly. Huh. So there's another song we're going to talk about soon that has no chorus as well. <laughs> These I can't wait. Formless Christmas songs. I mean, Silent Night. Does Silent Night have a chorus? <laughs> Silent <laughs> Night. Hers. I guess. I guess that's it. Even with the with the, with the with the waitress's song, I actually almost could see how it was written on the fly because it yeah. does have, in a playful, almost childlike way, sort of a feeling like it's being made up as it goes along because it's very rambling. Again, it's a story song, much like it's a happier story song, but it's a story song, much like Fairy Tale of New York. I think one of the reasons that it sort of I think the main reason that it gets in people's heads is it's actually the horns. The horns, the eighties were a good time for horns and that da -da 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 -da, that's the closest thing it gets to a chorus. That's super catchy. But I think the story, a lot of people like it because there are a lot of people, particularly in Los Angeles where we live, who where we're transplants or whatever, who spend the holidays alone. And so when it ends, 
it's all it's like a Craig, it, it's like Craigslist sponsor this song. It's full of misconnections. And then at the very end, when they actually someone should do a modern version of it with like misconnections, like, oh, I tried to text him and he didn't get my text or whatever. I saw in his stories he was here or whatever. <laughs> but when they finally, you know, cute meet at the end, it is a rom com. This song, this song needs to be a lifetime rom com. Movie. Right. What are we doing? We need to be pitching ha Hallmark uh you sometime in February so we'd be ready for next year. Make uh, it happen. This is a good song because here I am going to go deep again. It shows off how actually talented Patty Donahue, the late Patty Donahue, the singer of the waitresses was because, you know, she kind of talked, sang. She didn't have an incredible voice. She had presence for days. I mean, mm -hmm. no one commanded a, a stage or you know, her voice just gets your attention. But if you want to know how difficult this song is, try singing it at karaoke sometime. It is nope, a, there's no room for breath. No, it is a hard song to sing. I made the mistake a few years ago thinking, oh, yeah, Christmas rapping is easy. It's all monotone. Let me get up there. I was like, <laughs> oh, how about because I'm already out of breath. Yeah. Like, it's just, yeah, it's she. That's why with the Spice Girls had needed five people. I guess it was probably four. I don't know. I don't know if it was the pre or post Ginger Spice Spice Girls, <laughs> but they needed at least four voices to cover it. They needed a whole cast of Glee to do it. I embarrassing confession number 400 of the year <laughs> who's counting christmas rapping the title i had no idea it was a pun on christmas rapping as in hip-hop rapping because she rapped the song until like six or seven years ago it finally occurred to me yeah you should be embarrassed by that one how did you i'm the queen of puns i've already probably done 400 during this podcast it really took you that long to figure that out she's rapping i get it <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, at, le at least finally you got with the program. The first step is to admit your faults. <laughs> well, you know what is a fault is knowing you and knowing what's on brand for you and knowing what you like. I'm surprised it has taken this long to talk about the fact that Frankie Goes to Hollywood did a Christmas song. Uh, now, again, <laughs> uh, Last Christmas, is it a Christmas song? The Power of Love, which is what we're talking about, is on Welcome to the Pleasure Dome. If you listen to it, it, when it came, when the album came out, it was just a ballad on Welcome to the Pleasure Dome. There's nothing very Christmassy about the song. No holiday is mentioned. It's about being in love with someone. Uh, they mentioned vampires. Is it a Halloween song? <laughs> um, well, but then they make the video, which is completely a 180 from the Frankie Goes to Hollywood image of the time, where it's just this really sweet retelling of the birth of Christ. Yeah, and it's like a nativity scene. Yeah, a living in the nativity scene. In fact, the record company hated the final cut so much they made them go back and add the band as borders in the video. So you see two versions of that video, one without the band whatsoever, and then another version where Holly and Paul and everybody are just kind of surrounding the scene in a border. So, yeah, is it a Christmas song? It's a Christmas number video. one in the UK. Was it? Oh, yeah. Couldn't get arrested here. It was the third well, number one in the UK, but didn't even chart here. Well, I'm a little embarrassed to say this. I, I'll I'll do a confession confession itself. You, you know, you may have it may have taken you six or seven years ago to figure out the pun of Christmas wrapping. I didn't see this video until like a couple of years ago. Yeah, I don't know how I didn't see it because obviously I'm a fan of Frankie and I'm a fan of the era of the '80s, but it was not an MTV staple at all. They would play it when they would do Christmas videos. You remember when MTV would kind of do Christmas videos on Christmas Day? It would be like 24 hours. They would play it yeah. then. I saw it a couple times. I got so hyped that I actually saw it. If I'm celebrating Christmas within a party that's within a Frankie Goes to Holly video, I'd rather be spending Christmas inside the uncensored relax video yeah. directed by Bernard Rose than in the power of love video, but you make well, a good point. Their uh, marketing plan or their genius, whatever you want to call it was uh, sex war religion. And so religion was the third point that they had to hit in the marketing plan. That was the whole, yeah, there's a whole really thing. Tem tum marketing Paul Morley thing. If you, we had to do a whole podcast about that, but that was, that was the plan was to have these, what, what do people care about the most, these things. And so relax was in the that set. order, in that order God was the war. And there you have it. <laughs> well, obviously this is the gift that keeps on giving. This is going to be a two parter. So let's pause for now. We'll pick it up next time. We'll keep the celebration going. I'm Lindsay Parker and I've been joined today by the Bob Geldof to my mid or the other way around, whichever. 
John Hughes, the other John Hughes, the only John Hughes in my heart at the moment because uh-huh. I've enjoyed celebrating with you. We want to thank everybody who is celebrating listening at home. Have a safe holiday season. We'll catch you next time. Remember to give us a rate and review on your favorite podcast platform and we will catch you soon. This was Totally 80s, the podcast dedicated to the music of the greatest decade ever. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Totally 80s. And please leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Until our next episode, catch you on the flip side.